Hello, this is Michel Gagné. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate at the Mexican meeting. This nice invitation on behalf of uh, Professor Miguel Herrera, who has been here in Montreal at the Hotel Dieu at the beginning of uh, pioneering of laparoscopic adrenalectomy and uh, islet cell tumors, the pancreas. I will talk about serendipity. Uh, this is what uh, uh, he asked me to talk about. Let's um, share my screen. So hopefully you can see this. Serendipity. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I am a um, consultant in stock ownership, as you can see. But uh, um, I would like to promote a little bit uh, our book, The Perfect Sleeve Gastrectomy by Springer. This is a uh, collaboration of Dr. Ramos Palermo, Noel, and Noka on uh, everything you need to know about sleeve gastrectomy. Of course, uh, <clears throat> what is serendipity in modern medical breakthroughs? Uh, it's a happy accident. Uh, this uh, uh, was a nice article in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, almost 15 years ago. And um, it is discussed the role of chance or luck um, when we see unexpected discoveries in medicine. It is uh, probably around 30 to 50% of all scientific discoveries have a sense of some accidental uh, discovery. Uh, it happens when, um, during the process of discovery, a researcher finds a bug, not something he, ex he or she expected, and has to figure it out uh, why. And uh, usually at this time, uh, a discovery happens. For example, uh, famous uh, penicillin, when uh, mold had contaminated his culture, Alexander Fleming got the Nobel Prize for penicillin discovery. Another one is the uh, x-rays. <coughs> uh, William Rodgen, who uh, discovered that uh, uh, the paper he uh, put to protect the uh, light effect uh, had done, uh, in fact, an impression. Um, and uh, therefore, x-rays were discovered. And the same with, uh, more recently, Viagra, Sildenafil, which uh, had a uh, side effect of increasing blood flow uh, somewhere else. Of course, there, there's little records of these mistakes uh, and uh, reformulating the uh, hypothesis is the most important thing known as uh, serendipity. And it's also one of the hardest uh, word to translate. I think it got a new word in Spanish not uh, just a few years ago and um, in French as well. Uh, it is one of the 10 most hardest words to translate according to uh, the British uh, translation company. We owe to Horacio Walpole, who uh, wrote a book called The Three, The Princes of Serendip. Uh, he lived in the uh, uh, 18th century, and uh, this is his palace, uh, used to travel a lot uh, as uh, some sort of amb British ambassador, and in uh, as any um, uh, Good British subject at the time, spoke French and uh, many languages. He had uh, translated the, the book from the Chevalier de Mailly, who was uh, written in French um, initially in 1719. Uh, but the French came from an Italian book uh, written by Cristofero Ameno. And um, Cristofero Ameno, Armeno, had translated this book from Persian. Uh, living in Venice, a lot of uh, boats were coming from this area uh, for uh, uh, doing uh, commerce. Anyway, the uh, uh, Persian author, Amir Khusro, uh, uh, wrote uh, the book in Persian, which uh, uh, is uh, serendip is a Persian word for Sri Lanka, which is the setup of where the story is being told in Sri Lanka. And uh, Shaname um, uh, recalled the, uh, the tale of three princes of Serendip, which is based on the life of the Persian king 
Bahram V, uh, which ruled in 420. And it's about a, a lost camel and a treasure. And the king sends his three sons to look for this. And it is by serendipity that they find the camel and, and the treasure. So um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, story uh, found a treasure because uh, the camel was blind in one eye and the grass was eaten only on one side of the road. There was a missing tooth from this uh, camel and there were clump of uh, chewed grass in the road. Uh, apart from that, uh, the, the camel was lame and there was mainly three feet out of four uh, one was dragged, and so they found the camel and the treasure from these uh, indirect indices. My uh, implication with laparoscopic bariatric surgery goes back to my training at the Royal Victoria Hospital, which is uh, across uh, from uh, Hotel Dieu, where I started as a staff young surgeon in 1990. And uh, we did uh, porcine studies to look for laparoscopic Renoir gastric bypass as early as 1993. And um, I was interested in developing new techniques laparoscopically. And I was interested in transforming uh, the duodenal switch was done open by Dr. Marceau from Quebec City uh, to a laparoscopic technique. And hence, uh, at Mount Sinai, New York, in the laboratory, we started with uh, laparoscopic duodenal switch in May 1999 and did the first uh, human uh, in July 2nd, 1999, which included a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy as part of the operation. Uh, then, uh, by serendipity, we could not, after the sleeve gastrectomy in one patient, uh, we were doing this in high body mass index, uh, complete the uh, small bowel portion because the anesthesiologist told us to uh, stop the operation for difficulty to ventilate the patient. And uh, therefore, we had a patient with a standalone sleeve gastrectomy. And we realized that there was a lot of weight loss from this patient. And um, uh, to our, de to our de surprise, and uh, decided to use this as a tool to uh, decrease the risk of the uh, bowel operation uh, part of the duodenal switch, which had a uh, risk of leakage. So our first presentation on sleeve gastrectomy as a two-stage operation in February 2001 at the Snowbird uh, meeting of Dr. Schauer in Utah. And the first official meeting at a, at a meeting was at Sages in 2002 on a short series of this. Uh, the sleeve gastrectomy is a fairly easy technique in which we put a small bougie on the lesser curve and resect everything to the left, uh, taking the fundus, most of the body, and a small inferior triangular portion of the intra. The first it was published as an abstract for um, sages, as you can see in surgical endoscopy, and it was called two-stage laparoscopic DS uh, was, not, was not even called sleeve gastrectomy at the beginning. And uh, I had the pleasure in 2014 in Montreal to host the, uh, uh, if so, a world meeting on bariatric surgery, at which point we went to have five uh, sleeve gastrectomy consensus conference. Uh, the first one started in New York City uh, in 2007. And in 2014, we had five consensus conference at the time. We presented on a series of 103,000 sleeve gastrectomies um, in which the contraindication was Barrett's esophagus. Uh, um, so this is, in my opinion, a, a pretty strong uh, contraindication. The rest are relatives. Now in 2018, so we are almost 20 years after the sleeve, first sleeve gastrectomy, and uh, the numbers from the ESMBS shows that this operation has uh, increased uh, in a steady wise fashion with a decrease in Roux and Y gastric bypass. In fact, the numbers show that three quarters of all bariatric operation in the United States as primary procedures or sleeve gastrectomies now. 
if we look at the rest of the world, uh, these are recent numbers just published in May. Uh, Dr. Angrisani from the IFSO registry. IFSO registry is not perfect, but it's not because it's not capturing all uh, data from each country. Uh, but it's an indirect relationship <clears throat> a representation that sleegastrectomy is by far the commonest uh, bariatric operation worldwide. And if we look at the different continent, we see that the European community is the number one operation. North America, as I mentioned, is the number one operation, as well as Asia, Asia Pacific. But only Latin America, which has a different uh, idea of what the most uh, prevalent uh, bariatric operation is, and that is ruin y gastric bypass, although this is declining um, uh, slowly. Um, why is it so popular? In my opinion, is the perception from the patient that the operation is less morbid and gives a you know, quite similar weight loss as ruin y gastric bypass. And even if it's giving a little less, the patients are willing to undergo an operation that is less risky. And we know from this study of over 100,000 patients from the MBSQIP that uh, the morbidity and mortality is higher with gastric bypass. And this leaks are twice as much morbidity, serious morbidity is twice as much as well as mortality. And mortality is double, and this may represent 100 deaths per 100,000. And that is just initially. A uh, randomized control trial have demonstrated uh, uh, similarities. Uh, this is uh, the Swiss study, which shows a very similar weight loss between the two operations at five years. Remission of diabetes was not statistically significant. Uh, hypertension and sleep apnea as well. And GERD, however, was uh, uh, more prevalent after sleep gastrectomy than ruin y gastric bypass. The quality of life was similar. And uh, mortality, however, was only seen with ruin y gastric bypass. And if we combine the Finnish and the Swiss study, the mortality was only seen in ruin y gastric bypass. So the perception from the patient is that this operation is more dangerous. Uh, this is the Finnish study and a randomized control trial in JAMA. And you can see again, the body mass index is pretty similar at five years. The 30-day mortality was higher in ruin y gastric bypass, almost uh, a triple, uh, the less than 30 days morbidity. The more than 30 days complication was not statistically significant, but there was a trend towards more complication with ruin y gastric bypass. Remission of diabetes in this trial was not different. So the conclusion is that these two operations were pretty similar. Note that in terms of GERD in the Finnish study, there was much less GERD in the Finnish study than in the Swiss study. So it might be uh, the way you're doing the operation. There is a big trial uh, right now in Sweden. It's a randomized multi-center trial of 2,100 patients who is looking at um, the hypothesis that sleeve gastrectomy will experience 35% fewer complications during the five-year follow-up with uh, a weight loss that is within the margin of 5% of each other. So the study is ongoing, but already we have five-year data in this study. The annals of surgery look at reintervention and um, uh, mortality morbidity uh, over five years between the two operations. This is from Kaiser Permanente, looking at 35,000 uh, surgeries between the two groups. Um, and you can see that there is a 50% higher mortality at five years with ruin y gastric bypass by year five. A lot of reintervention, especially in the endoscopy sphere with ruin y gastric bypass, as well as laparoscopy, laparotomy, reintervention for internal hernia ball obstruction, uh, ulcers, perforating, or bleeding in the ruin y gastric bypass. These are life-threatening uh, complications, and they increase the mortality over time of ruin y gastric bypass. So I think it, it's fair to say that it is a safer operation. But uh, the sleeve gastrectomy has a higher rate of revision, most probably because we don't have good option 
for weight regain or reappearance of type 2 diabetes after ruin gastric bypass. In this French study, it is uh, about 10% at 10 years or 12% at 12 years of revision. And these are mostly for inadequate weight loss or re weight regain. And it happens mainly uh, higher in female sex patients body mass index more than 50, and these patients should be told that this is a two-stage operation. So a two-stage operation in my book is not a revision. And uh, <clears throat> previous gastric bending, if they had bending before the sleeve, uh, and they're more likely to get a revision. Again, in Sweden, a uh, follow-up of hospital readmission after gastric bypass, you have to note that after six years, one quarter of patients have been readmitted for serious hospital stay, mainly for GI surgery. This is only GI surgery, biliary operation, complex biliary operation of the biliary three, uh, bowel obstruction and perforation. And again, type two diabetes is not immune with Renoir gastric bypass. Most people say, oh, do a Renoir gastric bypass when the patient has type two diabetes. I beg to differ on this opinion. And this is based on uh, the study from uh, my previous fellow, Dr. Rubino and Geltrude Mingroni, who is in Rome and in London. In this randomized control trial, looking at medical therapy versus gastric bypass and biliopancreatic diversion, you can see that um, uh, BPD at two years had better resolution of type 2 diabetes. At five years, published in Lancet, this was 63% versus 37% for Renoir gastric bypass but look at 10 years. At 10 years, only one quarter of patients with Renoir gastric bypass had remission of type two diabetes. And this was 50% with the BPD operation, only 5% after medical therapy. So in my book, the BPD classic one is not done anymore, but the version of duodenal switch is the best operation. And I think we should do, be doing hypoabsorptive surgery. So if the patient had a sleeve gastrectomy and their type 2 diabetes is not gone, they can have the addition of a CD operation, which is a 250 centimeter or 300 centimeter loop of ileum connected to the lower part of the, of the sleeve. Um, and uh, in this uh, cohort uh, done by the Dutch, it also gives better weight loss. There's a tendency in Europe and in Latin America to do a Renoir gastric bypass after sleeve gastrectomy. It's not a good operation for weight loss. And this is demonstrated here that after two years, the percentage of total body weight loss is dramatically more with a SADI operation than with a Renoir gastric bypass. And I think the similar uh, observation for type two diabetes. Now the big controversy is, oh, we're gonna get uh, esophageal cancer, so we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, this is a nice uh, observational study in my own province in Quebec in Canada, where uh, because of the national health system, all the patients are captured and followed for nearly 97, 98%, a bit like Sweden and Scandinavian countries. And if we look at uh, uh, the patient captured over a period of 15 years, with Renoir gastric bypass versus sleeve gastrectomy and DS that are very reflux prone versus sleeve gastrectomy alone reflux prone and controls of obesity, there was no difference in terms of esophageal cancer uh, between the groups. And this is at 12 years. So I think we should you know, put a tone down on the risk of esophageal cancer. And this has been also demonstrated by the a nice paper published in SWORD from Aurora Pryor as a senior author from Stony Brook, looking at esophagitis Barrett's esophageal adenocarcinoma after bariatric surgery in the state of New York. In the state of New York, over um, a period of 15 years, they look at all the different operations and a total of nearly 50,000 records looked. There was 30% diagnosis of GERD, and 0.4% um, uh, had a diagnosis of esophagitis of Barrett's. And you can see that from the first year to the eighth year, the GERD has increased from 6% uh, to 42% by the eighth year. Esophagitis from 0.7 to 7% at eight year. Barrett's from 0.26 to 2% 2 
at eight year and adenocarcinoma from zero uh, to 0 0.08 uh, eight years later. And if you break down all these different operations, you can see the progression of GERD over 10 years, all the operation, and progression of esophagitis, all the operations, progression of Barrett's esophagus, all the operations, and uh, carcinoma the same. No statistical difference between the, the different groups at 10 years. Um, <clears throat> And uh, also in this uh, Karolinska Institute in, in Sweden, looking at the treatment of gastric bypass for reflux, what happens to these patients, 32,000 gastric bypass. And you can see that after the five years, the patients are back on medicine. 50% uh, of them are back on medicine and have reflux. Uh, so the operation will also fail in one out of two op patients. And if they don't get endoscopic surveillance, they will get esophageal carcinoma, just like the other operations. And the reason for this is that three out of four gastric bypass have reflux of acid. Also, a recent data shows that there's migration of the pouch transthoracic. This is done by a study uh, with CAT scan in Austria. And it has demonstrated that two thirds of gastric bypass have a migrated gastric pouch up into the chest. It's reminiscent to the problem of sleeve gastrectomy. It's not any different. So in conclusion, I would say that the long-term mortality concerns with gastric bypass, there is twice operative mortality. There's a 50% higher long-term mortality than sleeve gastrectomy. There is also something we haven't discussed. Uh, we remove a lot of gist tumor with sleeve gastrectomy, and yet they are left in place in row and y gastric bypass. There is also the risk of stomach cancer in many countries, especially in Latin America, when the this, this stomach is not removed, and this increases the risk of cancer on top of esophageal cancer. There is also concerns we have discussed of alcohol substance abuse, very severe ulcers that are bleeding or perforating, bone demonization and fractures from the problem of secondary hyperparathyroidism, and the risk of falls is increased in row and y gastric bypass. We know this from the Swedish obesity study. There's a risk of suicide and self-harm that is increased, and weight regain don't have good options for revisions. Uh, so with sleeve gastrectomy, we have a lot of options, and therefore it is, for me, the first operation for weight loss and diabetes. And then uh, as a, a tool, I decide if the patient needs a second intervention later on. So uh, sleeve gastrectomy is a less morbid operation with lesser risk, lesser risks long term, more options for revision, and more option for stages. So uh, as Gary Fine and James Deegan has uh, told us, each researcher must be ready to seize the clues on the road to discovery. Uh, we need to consider the fullness of the markings of serendipity, just as the ancient uh, princes of serendip. So uh, I wanna thank you for your attention and uh, hope that uh, uh, I can see you in person after this uh, COVID infection. Um, so that we can in person have a real discussion about these issues in bariatric surgery. Thank you very much.